In July 1969, the crew of Apollo 11 was preparing for the United States' first attempt at landing men on the moon. NASA, the space agency charged with making the mission possible, had existed for little more than a decade. Apollo 11 was the first of six successful moon missions, the result of an unprecedented surge in scientific and engineering activity with remarkable spin-offs. This is the story of how Cold War paranoia and incredible expenditure paid off. In less than nine years, the United States went from space amateur to technological hyperpower. In 1950s America, life was good. The country's vast productive power had switched from making tanks, ships, and aircraft during the Second World War to cars and refrigerators. The United States could dominate the world in a responsible, capitalist sort of way. America had emerged from the Second World War as the unchallenged nuclear-armed superpower. But there was a problem. The Soviet Union had finished the war with a giant battle-hardened army, and the country soon had its own nuclear weapons, becoming the world's second superpower. Its communist ideology, calling for international revolution, was a direct threat to the West. Both the Soviet Union and the United States had been working to extend their nuclear strike capabilities by developing missile technology. Here, the Soviets were at a disadvantage. Their primitive warheads were big and cumbersome. They had to design rockets capable of lifting much heavier loads. But in October 1957, the Soviets surprised everyone. The heavy lift R-7 rocket had sent Sputnik, the first artificial satellite, into orbit. The 83-kilogram sphere was equipped with nothing more than a beeping radio transmitter. Two days later, the Soviets tested a giant thermonuclear bomb, and America could not help but link the two events. gets the American people alarmed that a foreign country, especially an enemy country, can do this, and it, we fear this. In December 1957, America was preparing for its first satellite launch. A Vanguard rocket was to boost a tiny one-kilogram payload to orbit. Coast to coast, citizens were watching. was an intense humiliation for the United States. Just days later, a Soviet delegate to the UN asked whether America would like aid earmarked for underdeveloped countries. President Eisenhower had wanted a non-military rocket to carry his nation's first satellite. But the Redstone missile developed for the army by Werner von Braun was given the directive to salvage national pride with a second attempt. they would use the Juno-1. In 1958, free men everywhere lifted their gaze to Freedom Satellite. It was a success. Later that same year, the Eisenhower administration established NASA to coordinate the country's space efforts. Soon after, NASA recruited its first seven astronauts. They were all test pilots. <laughs> 
At this time in 1959, the United States had attempted 20 satellite launches. Only eight had been successful. In 1961, the Soviet Union sprang another surprise. His name was Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin. He would become the first cosmonaut. On the morning of April the 12th, Gagarin was strapped into Vostok 1. It carried air and food for 10 days. If its re-entry rockets failed, Gagarin could last until his craft's orbit decayed naturally. In 108 minutes, Vostok 1 completed one orbit and landed safely back in the Soviet Union. Three weeks later, Alan Shepard was preparing to become the first American in space in NASA's new Project Mercury. Before dawn on May the 5th, Shepard was delivered to the launch site two hours before the scheduled liftoff. This would be the first manned flight of the Redstone launcher. But the Redstone did not have the power to reach orbit. This would be a suborbital hop. In the spirit of the Cold War, Shepard had called his Mercury capsule Freedom 7. There were weather delays, and Shepard had been strapped into his seat for three hours before the flight started. Freedom 7 took him to a height of 187 kilometers, ending 15 minutes later in the Atlantic, where the capsule was picked up by a waiting aircraft carrier. It was successful, but compared to Gagarin's orbital flight, it was a poor second. Then, after another three weeks, there was a further development. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. This seemed like a very rash proposition. When President Kennedy made this speech, his country had only successfully launched 12 satellites. The US had made a further 16 attempts, which had all failed. The Atlas booster, due to take the first American to orbit, was still having problems. But a new fast-tracked program, under the direction of German engineer Dr. Werner von Braun, had been underway for several years. A new launcher, the Saturn I, was an attempt to surpass the Russians' heavy lift capability. It would use a cluster of narrow tanks that could easily be fabricated using the tooling developed for the country's existing rocket fleet. It would also cluster eight rocket engines to deliver the required thrust. The engine used was the H1. It was a direct descendant of the engine that powered Germany's V2 rocket. After the Second World War, Werner von Braun and some of his team of rocket designers had surrendered to the American forces. With them came hardware and extensive drawings. Tests began in New Mexico using modified V2s. Blueprints for the V2's engine were given to North American Aviation, who implemented proposed improvements mentioned in the Nazi documentation. A spin-off company, Rocketdyne, handled the work and are still making rocket engines today. In developing the Saturn I, there was a change in the approach of the engineers. They were keen to avoid the high rates of failure that had occurred with other rockets. This meant that all components would now be tested exhaustively before undertaking a launch. <laughs> 
This included the H1 engine, which was required to deliver 99% reliability. Finally, in October 1961, the first Saturn was ready for flight testing. It was a giant first stage with a dummy second stage and nose cone. As it sat on the pad taking fuel, technicians were methodically checking the rocket's subsystems. This was time consuming and would later be monitored by computer. High-speed film cameras were focused at critical areas of the pad launcher interface, a technique that continues to this day. The first test of a new rocket design was never expected to go well, but the Saturn I performed flawlessly. It was a small step towards President Kennedy's goal of landing a man on the moon. Although Congress was allocating huge sums for what was now called Project Apollo, NASA still had no clear idea how they could do it. There were two competing approaches. Direct ascent, where astronauts would ride a huge craft directly to the moon and land it there and then return. Or Earth rendezvous, where two rockets would launch separate parts into Earth orbit, which would link up and then fly to the moon and land. There were various concepts for a spacecraft that would fly from the Earth to the moon, land and then return. All were huge. Both of these approaches would require a rocket of huge proportions and designs for the giant Nova were studied. There was a third method proposed, which required a rendezvous in lunar orbit. It called for a dedicated lunar lander which could be discarded after it served its purpose. Langley engineer John Hubolt was convinced that this was the only way to get to the moon within President Kennedy's 1969 deadline. In July 1961, Gus Grissom had become America's second astronaut with another 15-minute suborbital flight. At this stage, two craft rendezvousing in orbit was seen as a tremendous challenge. A rendezvous in lunar orbit was seen as madness, and Hubolt's Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, LOR, was dismissed. But Hubolt and an informal group working at Langley had been studying the problems associated with orbital rendezvous since the 1950s, and they understood the mathematics very well. Frustrated at having the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous plan blocked from access to higher management, he wrote a strongly worded letter to the NASA administrator. In it, he asserted that the only way to meet the presidential deadline was LOR. He insisted that a man could be put on the moon without the need for NOVA. With the LOR concept now in the open, the theory and the calculations were scrutinized closely and while the idea was still resisted, the plan was sound. Finally, when Werner von Braun became convinced, Lunar Orbit Rendezvous was adopted. In August 1961, German Tito was preparing to become Russia's second cosmonaut. At 25, he remains the youngest person to fly in space. His flight, in Vostok 2, made 17 orbits, with Tito remaining aloft for more than a day. He was the first man to eat in space, the first man to sleep in space, and the first man to suffer from space sickness. NASA were resigned to their second ranking in what had become known as the space race. With the newest version of the Atlas booster, they felt they were closing the gap. An unmanned flight went well, but they were still worried. To the humiliation of the astronaut corps, Chimp 81, later called Enos, would be the first to fly on the Atlas. 
It was the first capsule to have solid-state electronics. There were some small problems during this flight, but Enos returned safely, paving the way for NASA's first manned orbital flight. In February 1962, John Glenn was to be the first American to go into orbit in a capsule he had named Friendship 7. The American people were taking their country's role in the space race very seriously now. Glenn's flight was an opportunity for the US to salvage some pride. John Glenn completed three orbits and returned to an Atlantic splashdown without incident. As development continued successfully on the Saturn booster and the Mercury program began more ambitious missions, NASA was getting a clearer view of its path to the moon. A new group of astronauts was recruited, with names like Neil Armstrong, John Young, and James Lovell. And the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous plan meant that a new program would be implemented before Project Apollo. Originally called Mercury 2, the program eventually emerged as Project Gemini. A larger version of the Mercury capsule that would carry two astronauts was rapidly designed. It featured ejector seats like a jet fighter, and it would be boosted to orbit atop a refinement of the Titan II missile originally intended to carry a nuclear warhead. Training for the two-man missions began ahead of a tightly packed schedule of launches. Additional Mercury missions were scrapped. There were very specific objectives laid down for the Gemini program. Orbital rendezvous had to be mastered and docking with a target vehicle had to become routine. Planners also knew that any trip to the moon would involve leaving the spacecraft and surviving in the vacuum of space in a pressure suit. New infrastructure was built. At Cape Canaveral, a giant vehicle assembly building for the coming Saturn family of rockets was commenced. In Alabama, a captive rocket test facility was built and there were new engine test stands constructed in Mississippi. At the new Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, Texas, a new mission control hub was constructed. It would monitor every detail of every mission. Largely due to the energy of Vice President Lyndon Johnson, Texas was to become the focal point of America's space efforts. It was September 1962, before a crowd in the stadium of Rice University in Houston of the leading space city gives such a warm welcome to our president of the United States. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Though the American people were largely on side with the country's space goals, Kennedy understood that the huge expenditures now being made could easily lead to an erosion of the national support. But in little more than 12 months, when the president returned to Texas, he was assassinated. Lyndon Johnson was now the president. He strengthened his position in 1964 with a landslide win in the presidential election. And under his leadership, America's space objectives remained unchanged. In August 1962, the Soviet Union had set another space first. Vostok 3 and Vostok 4 orbited at the same time. NASA felt the Russians were already working towards orbital rendezvous. 
In June 1963, another cosmonaut was preparing for another first. Valentina Tereshkova would be the first woman to go into orbit. In October 1964, Vladimir Komarov, the commander, flight engineer Konstantin Feoktistov, and medical specialist Boris Yegorov flew to orbit on a new spacecraft, Voskhod 1. And they wore normal clothing, not spacesuits. To NASA, it seemed that the Russians were starting their own equivalent of the three man Apollo program. Towards the end of 1964, Cosmonaut Alexei Leonov began training with a new piece of equipment. His Voskhod capsule would be fitted with a collapsible canvas airlock that would let him leave the craft. The Voskhod capsule's electronics used thermionic valves, which relied on the ambient air to dissipate their heat, so the capsule could not be depressurized. In March 1965, Alexei Leonov on Voskhod 2 became the first person to leave his capsule and float freely in space. Again, the Soviet Union had beaten America in one of the critical steps NASA had stated it would need to master before an attempt at landing on the moon. The complete story did not emerge until after the fall of the Soviet Union. Once outside, Leonov's spacesuit swelled like a balloon, making him too large to re-enter the airlock. Only by drastically venting his suit pressure could he squeeze back inside. The Gemini spacecraft was a huge advance in capsule design. Mercury astronaut Gus Grissom had been involved in the capsule's development and was responsible for the way pilot control systems resembled aircraft controls. Like the Mercury capsule, it had corrugated titanium skin, but its life support systems and power were housed in a separate module that was discarded before re-entry. The astronauts had separate hatches and sat in ejector seats. Importantly, these hatches could be reopened and closed in space to allow for spacewalks. The first manned Gemini flight, Gemini 3, blasted off in July 1965. Aboard were Gus Grissom and John Young. Three orbits and five hours later, their craft landed in the Atlantic, just west of the Bahamas, 84 kilometers short of the intended target. Importantly, Gemini 3 had been the first spacecraft to change its orbit, a vital development toward NASA's short-term goal of orbital rendezvous. Grissom and Young's flight had been a morale booster for America's space effort, and they were treated as heroes. Less than a week after their return, the two astronauts were given a ticker tape parade through the streets of New York. People were now taking the idea of a moon landing seriously. At the White House, the astronauts met with President Johnson. In parallel with the Gemini program, hardware for the Apollo missions continued development. The final configuration of the Apollo spacecraft had been decided, and mock-ups were fabricated for use in testing other parts of the Apollo system. Because the Apollo command module was bigger than all previous spacecraft, the designers had opted to return to the use of an escape tower, similar to the Mercury capsule, to lift the crew clear in an emergency. A special launcher known as Little Joe 2 was developed to test the escape system under a variety of simulated malfunctions. During one trial, a real problem occurred 
and the escape tower worked perfectly. Dummy capsules were dropped from aircraft to iron out problems with the landing parachutes. Because the Apollo missions would all splash down in the ocean, the capsule was tested in water. There was always a trade-off between weight and strength, and sometimes the engineers had to go back to the drawing board. Testing of the new Saturn rocket and its refinement, the Saturn 1B, was going well with no test flight failures. On the morning of June the 3rd, 1965, Gemini 4 was being prepared. For astronauts James McDivitt and Ed White, it would be their first flight. This would be the first mission controlled from the new Integrated Mission Control Center in Houston. Launch control remained at the Cape, but after the launcher had cleared the tower, all aspects of the remaining Gemini and Apollo flights were controlled from this complex. This would be NASA's first long-duration flight. An attempt was made to rendezvous with the Titan upper stage, but with little success and depleted fuel reserves, the exercise was abandoned. Above Australia, White and McDivitt donned their spacesuits and began depressurizing the capsule. Ed White had to struggle with his hatch door, which had jammed. But after attention from McDivitt, who understood the problem, it opened and White stepped outside. He was tethered to the spacecraft by an eight meter line that fed him oxygen. To maneuver, he had a small zip gun that expelled oxygen. It worked well, but was soon running low on gas. A communication problem meant that while Mission Control could hear him, they could not speak to him. Messages had to be relayed via McDivitt. It all looked deceptively simple. But other than be outside, White had no real task to perform. Around the world, these pictures captured huge press attention. Right from its inception, NASA had made a commitment to openness. It was the one glaring difference between America and its Cold War adversary. Jim McDivitt and Ed White were both alumni of Michigan University, which held a ceremony for the astronauts when they were back on the ground. Although the Soviet Union may still be ahead in the space race, America was catching up, and the unfettered access NASA allowed the press meant that the Gemini program became a media phenomenon. For McDivitt and White, there followed the now regulations ceremonial at the White House. Public support meant that lavish funding kept flowing and the accelerated development of Apollo hardware continued behind the scenes. Booster testing of the Saturn I had concluded and its direct descendant, the Saturn IB, was being fabricated for several unmanned missions. It was earmarked for the first manned Apollo flight, scheduled for 1967. The giant C-5, now known as the Saturn V, was also being built. This was the rocket that would take men to the moon. Unlike the clustered tanks hastily pressed into service for the Saturn I, the Saturn V had larger, lighter single tanks, and it replaced the eight H-1 engines with five much larger F-1 engines. Gemini 5 launched in August 1965. It was the first time a spacecraft had been powered by fuel cells rather than batteries. This would enable flights of much longer duration. But the system gave problems. 
In addition, the spacecraft's thrusters were unreliable. The crew of Gordon Cooper and Pete Conrad were forced to abandon a rendezvous exercise through diminished electrical supply and limited control of their craft. But Gemini 5 did set a new record for endurance. As Wally Shira and Tom Stafford sat in their Gemini 6 spacecraft, an Atlas Agena on an adjacent pad was ready for launch. The Gemini capsule had been designed for docking, and in October 1965, they would make the first attempt to rendezvous and dock with the Agena target vehicle. The launch of the Agena was perfect, but shortly after stage separation, Radar picked up five distinct objects. The craft had exploded. There was no point in proceeding with the mission. Scheduling for the Gemini program had been tight, with roughly one new launch every six weeks. There was no replacement Agena ready to launch before the next flight, Gemini 7. It was decided that Gemini 6, now called 6A, would rendezvous with Gemini 7, which would launch first. This would mean a very rapid turnaround between launches which used the same facilities. In December 1965, Frank Borman and Jim Lovell were preparing for NASA's longest duration mission yet. The plan called for a flight of 14 days, more than long enough for a return trip to the moon. The schedule called for Gemini 6A to launch eight days later. Shira and Stafford had been through this exact procedure just seven weeks earlier. There could be no faulty target vehicle to let them down. They're cleared for takeoff. Roger, adios. Out of five, four, three, two. A plug had released early, forcing an automatic shutdown. For the second time, Shira and Stafford had been unable to get off the ground. Very good. Three days later, Gemini 6A launched successfully. Within six hours, the two Geminis were side by side. Rendezvous was one of the difficult maneuvers that had to become routine before a realistic attempt at landing on the moon could be made. Although the American public may not have appreciated the finer points of orbital mechanics, moving pictures of a spacecraft in orbit again roused huge media attention. Gemini 7 set a new record for time in orbit, but during the last few days, the spacecraft had developed thruster problems. The return to Earth was technically uneventful, though Borman and Lovell were weakened after two weeks in space. Astronauts were now greeted as returning heroes with intense press coverage. They were becoming celebrities. Next were two first-time astronauts, Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott. As mission commander, Neil Armstrong would be the first American civilian to go to space. Gemini 8 had a very busy flight plan. Docking still had not been achieved, and this flight was scheduled to rendezvous and dock with an Agena target vehicle that would launch an hour before the Gemini. This launch was perfect, and the crew of Gemini 8 were able to rendezvous and finally to dock with the target vehicle. But again, there was a thruster problem, which sent the two docked craft into a spin. Armstrong separated the craft, but the rate increased. A Gemini yaw thruster was stuck on. Flight rules called for a prompt return. The destroyer, Leonard F. Mason, picked up the crew and their capsule from the Pacific, an ocean away from the planned recovery region. 
On Gemini 9, Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan would try to achieve the objectives unmet by Gemini 8. Docking was still to be mastered, and as a substitute for the Agena target vehicle, a shorter unit, known as the Augmented Target Docking Adapter, was launched. It achieved orbit, but there was a worrying light displayed on a console in mission control. When Stafford and Cernan caught up with their target, they saw the ascent shroud still in place. An argument between contractors meant the team that normally fitted the fairing was sidelined, resulting in what became known as the Angry Alligator. The target was useless, and Gemini 9 had nothing to dock with. In addition, a spacewalk by Cernan saw him exhausted and drenched in sweat with his helmet fogging. Tight deadlines laid down for the American space program were accelerating development, but was NASA courting disaster? A mission review committee was established to make certain objectives were realistic. Rendezvous and docking had been hampered by equipment failure, but mission planners were confident it would be mastered. The one outstanding problem facing the Gemini team was the spacewalk, or EVA, for extravehicular activity. After Ed White's joyride in space, it came as a surprise that it was so difficult to actually work in weightlessness. Practice for this activity on the ground had focused on a low friction air table technique, but it was nothing like being weightless and in a vacuum. For brief periods in an aircraft traveling along a parabolic curve, an astronaut could experience weightlessness. This was difficult, but with only three more Gemini missions scheduled, it was felt to be of value. In December 1966, John Young and Michael Collins on Gemini 10 had very similar mission objectives to the previous two Gemini flights. They successfully rendezvoused and docked with their Agena target. Then, using the Agena's engine, boosted their orbit to a new record high. The craft then rendezvoused with the spent Agena used by Gemini 8. Collins made two spacewalks, losing his camera in the process. As he made his way to the target craft, he found it difficult to gain purchase. He was suffering similar difficulties to his colleagues on previous flights. Gemini 11 had a two-second launch window. Pete Conrad and Dick Gordon performed a direct ascent rendezvous just 94 minutes after launch. This was the type of rendezvous planned for the Apollo missions. They docked and undocked four times giving NASA confidence in their rendezvous and docking ability. Then, using the Agena's engine, the linked craft achieved a record orbital high point of 1,300 kilometers. During EVA, Gordon attached a tether to the Agena as part of a gravitational experiment. But yet again, the process was exhausting compared with simulated exercises on the ground. NASA had just one more Gemini mission to iron out their EVA problems. Planners decided to try a new simulation in preparation for the EVAs scheduled for the final Gemini flight. Buzz Aldrin went through neutral buoyancy training at the McDonough School swimming pool near Baltimore. There would be new anchor points installed on both spacecraft. A waste tether was part of the new equipment. Astronauts had said they used too much energy just trying to maintain their position. As Jim Lovell and Buzz Aldrin walked to their launcher, they wore signs saying, the end. The final Gemini mission was a big news event. The next space flight was to be Apollo 1, due for launch in February 1967. Though the flight plan called for the same rendezvous and docking as the previous four missions, 
Each flight was about refinement of technique, particularly the way in which the guidance computer was being used. But the prime objective for Gemini 12 was EVA. Gemini 12 blasted off on the 11th of November, 1966. Rendezvous and docking was straightforward. And so were the EVAs. Aldrin followed the new protocols with restraints and scheduled rest periods and was able to use tools designed for Apollo. With Gemini 12, NASA was confident it had mastered the techniques needed for the challenging Apollo program. Saturn 1B had made two unmanned flights with early versions of the Apollo Command and Service modules. Both were suborbital flights. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were slated as the crew for the first orbital mission, Apollo 1, with a Block 1 command module. In training for the mission, they were frustrated at the continuous changes being made to the Apollo spacecraft. It was the culmination of everything NASA had learned from the Mercury and Gemini programs, but it was not coming together easily. On January the 27th, 1967, the crew and support team were doing a plugs out test, a launch simulation where the craft was not connected by umbilicals. As had been the case on all previous missions, they were breathing pure oxygen at slightly above atmospheric pressure. The Saturn 1B was not fueled and the tests were not regarded as dangerous. But a spike in voltage triggered a flash fire in the spacecraft and in seconds the crew were dead. Flammable materials and the pure oxygen atmosphere were a lethal combination. High pressure in the capsule made opening the inward swinging door difficult. The United States was in mourning. Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger Chaffee were buried with full military honours. Many at NASA had been dreading this kind of outcome. In a speech to colleagues at Mission Control, Flight Director Gene Kranz said, we were too gung-ho about the schedule, and we locked out all of the problems we saw each day in our work. Manned flights were suspended. The space agency had to find out what went wrong and then completely redesign the capsule and mission procedures. All Apollo remnants were impounded and NASA initiated an exhaustive investigation. Both houses of Congress also set up inquiries. Frank Borman was the only astronaut to serve on NASA's accident review board. He was commander on his first mission and he had been selected to command the third manned Apollo mission but there was a cloud over the whole program. Ultimately, Borman's testimony before a House committee helped convince Congress that the manned Apollo program was safe to resume operations. Outside the inquiries, NASA tried to maintain its focus. Astronauts who were experts in spaceflight were now being sent on field trips to learn about geology in preparation for the moon missions. Since 1964, the Soviet Union's space program had gone quiet. But in April 1967, news broke that Vladimir Komarov, flying in a new three-person spacecraft known as Soyuz-1, had failed to deploy its parachutes, killing the cosmonaut. <laughs> 
Although in the United States, manned missions for 1967 had been put on hold, NASA was still busy. The new Saturn V was almost ready for its first flight. Its three stages and their engines had all been exhaustively tested on the ground. For flight testing, NASA had adopted a new all-up testing plan that had worked in missile development. It involved more risk, but testing all stages together rather than on separate flights would save a lot of time. Intelligence reports were beginning to filter through that the Soviets were running their own lunar program to maintain their lead in what clearly was a race for the moon. The first Saturn V launch also marked the first use of the new launch control complex at the Kennedy Space Center. Originally scheduled for late 1966, developmental problems with the second stage pushed the launch out to November 1967. Not all managers were happy with the all-up test, but they realized that if everything worked, it will eliminate four launches. There was a fear of a launch pad explosion. With 90% of the Saturn V's launch weight being highly explosive fuel, calculations had been made to understand the damage a low altitude failure could create. A malfunction would have been catastrophic, almost certainly causing NASA to miss its 1969 deadline. Ignition sequence starts. Five, four, we have ignition. All engines are running. We have liftoff. We have liftoff at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Apollo 4 bristled with sensors and small film cameras. The cameras were sealed inside pods that were ejected after staging. Some of the most memorable images of the Apollo program come from these cameras observing stage separation. In the Gemini launches, the first stages had exploded after separation. Though this did not threaten missions, engineers wanted to understand everything that happened. There were no surprises. The new Saturn V behaved exactly as its designers had intended. The lunar module, a vital piece of the Apollo hardware, had suffered changes in design with resulting fabrication delays. Engineers began loosely basing their plans on helicopters, but the large windows were soon dispensed with because of their weight the astronauts would have to stand close to tiny windows to see their landing place. Learning to fly a craft designed to land on the moon was not easy. At its Langley Research Center, NASA had built a lunar module simulator. It tried to recreate a lunar gravity environment so astronauts could practice the last 50 meters of their descent to the lunar surface. More popular with the astronauts was the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle and its offshoot, the Lunar Landing Training Vehicle. It was nicknamed the Flying Bedstead. In lunar simulation mode, a jet engine counterbalanced five-sixths of the craft's weight. Control of the craft came from variable rocket engines similar to that on the lunar module. When astronaut Neil Armstrong made his second flight in the research vehicle, things did not go according to plan. NASA had concern about the reliability of these machines, making a number of attempts to withdraw them from service, and with good reason. The craft's rapid development had not included wind tunnel testing, and even in slight breezes there were control issues. Armstrong ejected safely just 60 meters above the ground, but the training vehicle continued as an important adjunct to the Apollo program. Results from the inquiry into the Apollo 1 fire 
had led to an extensive redesign of the Apollo command module. The hatch now opened outwards and could be unlocked quickly. The wiring was shielded in non-flammable sleeves and combustible materials inside the craft were excluded. Apollo spacesuits had been changed as well to eliminate flammable materials. Unlike the Gemini suits, which were air-cooled, Apollo astronauts would now wear an inner suit crisscrossed with tubing to carry cooling water. Above that, there was a blue pressure garment with an outer protective layer of fire-resistant beta cloth. A completely sealed helmet that did not swivel with the head was introduced. A backpack could be added for life support and radio communication independent of the spacecraft. The suit was named the Extra Vehicular Mobility Unit, or EMU for short, and although it has been refined, the same design remains in use to this day. Wally Shira, Don Isley and Walter Cunningham would make the Apollo program's first manned flight. By October 1968, NASA had confidence in the new command module. Apollo 7 would launch to Earth orbit on a Saturn 1B. The bigger Apollo capsule provided a more comfortable environment, necessary for long duration flights that were required to get to the moon. The crew could take off or put on their bulky spacesuits as required, and they didn't have to remain in their couches as in the Mercury and Gemini spacecraft. Soon after reaching orbit, the command and service module separated from the S-4B upper stage. On a moon mission, this would normally house the lunar module. One of the four adapter panels had not opened fully. On subsequent flights, these would separate completely from the upper stage. The spacecraft turned around and practiced docking using a visual reference target that would usually be mounted on the lunar module. Not long into the mission, Shira came down with a cold, and in the confines of the capsule, it quickly spread to the other two. In zero gravity, the nasal congestion was not clearing in the same way it would on Earth and the crew were very uncomfortable. Eating became a sore point with the astronauts. Though the food had improved since the earlier space missions, the freeze-dried and bite-sized rehydratable meals fell short of what they considered acceptable. The demands on this mission were considerable. Tense interchanges between the sick astronauts and mission control were not uncommon. They had to fire the service module engine no less than eight times. Public relations reached new heights on the mission. A series of TV broadcasts from the capsule were watched around the world. At one point, Shira refused to switch on the TV equipment because the schedule was too crowded and the crew had not eaten. Preparing for re-entry, a new dispute broke out. The astronauts refused to wear their helmets during the return to Earth. With their colds, they worried about the rapid changes in pressure. They wanted to hold their noses and blow to equalize the buildup. Aboard the carrier Essex, the Apollo 7 astronauts were treated as returning heroes. But they did not receive the usual NASA honors, and Shira, Isley and Cunningham never flew again. At the Kennedy Space Center, another Saturn V was being assembled. It would be the first Saturn V to carry people. Frank Borman, Jim Lovell and William Anders were training hard for the mission, due to fly to Earth orbit with a lunar module, to test procedures in docking, undocking and staging of the lunar lander. Unexpectedly, their training was interrupted. The Apollo 8 crew, along with their backup crew, were called to a meeting just months before the flight. Problems with the lunar module would lead to a delay of many months endangering the 1969 moon landing deadline. 
so a new mission was proposed. Apollo 8, without a lunar module, would fly to the moon and go into orbit. Intelligence reports had suggested that the Soviet Union was planning to make a similar attempt, and NASA had no intention of being beaten again by the Russians. The Apollo 8 astronauts would be the first people to leave Earth orbit on a mission that would test the command module in deep space. The objectives had changed to understanding long-range communication, spacecraft navigation, and the examination of potential lunar landing areas. The flight would be a risk. Although the first Saturn V flight had gone well, the second, known as Apollo 6, had not. Engineers were confident they understood the problems and had solved them. Borman, Anders and Lovell had to have faith that the issues would not recur. We have commit. We have, we have lift off. Lift off at 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It was a flawless launch. Eleven and a half minutes later, the spacecraft was in a parking orbit with crew and ground staff checking all systems. During the second orbit, mission control gave them the thumbs up. All right, you are go for TLI, over. Roger, stand, we're go for TLI. TLI, translunar injection. Soon after, the S-4B upper stage fired, pushing Apollo 8 out of Earth orbit toward the moon. Now a new problem arose. Frank Borman began to feel sick and threw up, which was even more unpleasant in zero gravity. Because of the attitude of the spacecraft, they could not see the moon, but through the round window, they began seeing more and more of the Earth. They were the first people to see our planet in its entirety. However, this window soon fogged with gas from the oils in the chemical sealant. Apollo 7 had also suffered from this problem. As Apollo 8 approached the moon, the crew prepared for an engine burn that would place the craft in lunar orbit. The main engine had to fire for four minutes when the command module was behind the moon, out of radio contact. This was the first time the crew got a decent view of the moon. William Anders prepared to photograph the lunar surface. An important part of the mission was to document areas such as the Sea of Tranquility in preparation for future lunar landings. On their fourth orbit, they saw something astounding. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, is that pretty? Hey, don't take that from the schedule. After this mission, it was said, they went to the moon and discovered the that Earth. Color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color quick, Oh, man, that's great. Hurry. Where is it? Quick. After 10 orbits of the moon, Apollo 8 fired its main engine and began its return to Earth. During the cruise back, Bill Anders captured more pictures of the Earth. The Apollo 8 astronauts returned as heroes. Their flight around the moon had put NASA's space effort back on the front pages. On their return to Houston, there was an outpouring of national pride. Finally, the US was winning the space race. But it was the end of 1968, and there was only one year left to reach the moon within President Kennedy's deadline. The missing piece of the Apollo system was the lunar module. It had existed as a mock-up for five years, but there had been delays in manufacture of the final craft. No one had built a moon lander before, and there was nothing similar to base it on. Throughout its development, its designers were repeatedly asked to cut its weight by the builders of the Saturn V, as they gained a clearer understanding of the capabilities of the launch system. In March 1969, 
A lunar module with a crew was headed to Earth orbit. Apollo 9 would be the first test of the complete Apollo system. Russell Swicart, Dave Scott, and Commander Jim McDivitt faced a punishing schedule. They would test the lunar module and the life support backpack for use on the lunar surface. Once in orbit, the command and service module separated from the S-4B upper stage that carried the lunar module. They docked with the lunar lander to withdraw it from the S-4B. After separation, Apollo 9 backed away to a safe distance and ground control sent the discarded stage on a course toward the sun. The next few days were spent in maneuvers with the main engine being fired five times, changing the orbit in preparation for testing of the lunar module and to simulate mid-course corrections that would be needed on a trip to the moon. The crew removed the hatches and probes to clear the connecting tunnel between the command module and the lunar module that had been named Gumdrop and Spider. These were the first craft to be named since Gemini 3's Molly Brown. Every aspect of the linked spacecraft was closely monitored in mission control. Soon, McDivitt and Swicart would fly in a machine that had no capability of returning to the ground, and nothing could go wrong. In case something did go wrong and the two craft couldn't dock again, a spacewalk had been planned to test an outside transfer between Spider and Gundrop. This was the Apollo program's first spacewalk, and Russell Swicart was only connected by a nylon tether. All his oxygen and electrical power came from the portable life support system he wore on his back. OK, Dave, come on out. Both spacecraft had been depressurized, and while Swicart was busy at the lunar module, Dave Scott was retrieving an experimental sample from the outside of the command module. This spacewalk was cut short because Swicart was suffering from space sickness. Okay, we're nice and stable with respect to you. The next day, Spider and Gumdrop separated for the first time. It's a nice looking machine. So it's yours. Using its descent engine, the lunar module withdrew to a distance of around 150 kilometers. The next time Dave Scott in the command module saw the lunar module, it had jettisoned its lower half. All engine tests for both stages had worked well, and NASA was developing confidence in its new moon craft. Before redocking with the command module, McDivitt and Swicart did a complex series of pirouettes to allow Scott to inspect the craft from every angle. When the three astronauts were reunited, the lunar module was jettisoned, eventually to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. They spent several more days in orbit photographing the Earth before splashing down in the Atlantic. NASA had just nine months more to meet President Kennedy's end of the decade deadline for putting a man on the moon. But there would be one more step before they made the first attempt to land. Oh, our stage is pressurized. Apollo 10 would take a lunar module to the moon and descend toward the surface, but it would not land. In keeping with NASA's very tight schedule, it had a long list of questions to answer, and the mission would have the most experienced crew of any Apollo mission so far. Lunar module pilot Gene Cernan had flown on Gemini 9. Command module pilot John Young had flown on Gemini 3 and 10. And Commander Tom Stafford had flown on Gemini 6 and 9. One of the important problems that this mission had to solve was linked with the moon's uneven gravitation. 
Previous manned and unmanned lunar orbital missions had discovered that variable concentrations of mass within the moon had caused lunar orbits to be erratic. NASA needed to map these irregularities to fully understand how their spacecraft would perform in lunar orbit. Nine. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on five, four, three, two. All engines running. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff 49 minutes past the hour. Apollo 10 would be a complete rehearsal for the first lunar landing. It would be the second Apollo craft to leave Earth orbit. Docking with and extraction of the lunar module, which had been the major focus of previous missions, was becoming commonplace. Again, it's looking real stable to us. We show you close and finally. Apollo 10 was the first spacecraft to make color television transmissions, and they pulled in audiences of around one billion. As in the previous mission, Apollo 10 had two spacecraft, each needing a different call sign. The astronauts had elected to call the mothership Charlie Brown and the lunar module Snoopy after the popular Peanuts cartoon strip of the time. Subsequently, space crews were asked to choose names that had a little more gravitas. After they disappeared behind the moon, they fired the main engine for six minutes, which the astronauts described as being interminable. The craft went into lunar orbit as planned, and six hours later, Stafford and Cernan entered Snoopy to prepare it for descent toward the lunar surface. It was teeming with weightless flakes of mylar insulation that had come loose when the connecting tunnel had pressurized. This caused itching for the rest of the flight. But there were more problems. Charlie Brown, Houston. Uh, we're concerned about this yaw bias uh, in the limb and uh, apparent slippage of the uh, docking ring. We'd like you to uh, disable... The lunar module was more than three degrees out of alignment with the command module, and air pressure in the tunnel between the two craft could not be released. Houston was worried that undocking now could damage the latches that held them together. Engineers on the ground decided that anything less than six degrees was not a problem, and Snoopy was given the all clear to undock. This was the first time a lunar module had flown in the environment for which it had been designed. Mission planners were concerned that Stafford and Cernan might try to seize the opportunity to make an unauthorized landing. So Snoopy had been short-fueled. If they did land, they could not get back. For the next eight hours, John Young would be alone in Charlie Brown. Houston, Houston. Charlie Brown, how do you read on high gate? Over. Charlie Brown, Houston, over. Great. Sounds great. We copy. Snoopy dropped lower and lower, passing directly over the proposed landing site for the next Apollo mission and traveling more than 500 kilometers from the mothership. But just before they were due to jettison the descent stage, a guidance setting switch, which was in the wrong position, caused the lunar module to gyrate wildly. By dumping the descent stage and switching to manual control, Tom Stafford was able to regain stability. Charlie, how was the stage good, huh? Wait till that thing blinks. 
Charlie Brown, uh, Houston, they got staging. Uh, it, they uh, it had a wild uh, gyration, though, but they got it under control. Over. The rendezvous went according to plan, and Apollo 10 remained in lunar orbit for another 29 hours, mapping anomalies in the lunar gravity before returning to the Earth. But even as they were near the moon, another Saturn V had been rolled out to the launch pad. Apollo 11 was being prepared for the first attempt at a landing on the moon. Early on July the 16th, 1969, vast numbers were gathering along the beaches of central Florida to witness history. The American people had been preparing for this moment for almost a decade since the late President Kennedy set a moon landing as the nation's goal. More than a million people were crowding the roads and causeways around Cape Canaveral that had been renamed Cape Kennedy. Minor dignitaries and friends and family of space workers had access to special stands constructed in the grounds of the Kennedy Space Center to see the Apollo 11 astronauts blast off. While the public had great faith in NASA's ability to land men on the moon, the experts working in the space business put their chances of success at no better than 50-50. The astronauts had spent long hours in simulators preparing for every eventuality, yet the equipment they used for practice only provided an approximation of conditions in space, with some of the test rigs appearing bizarre. A special gantry built at NASA Langley provided something approaching the experience of lunar gravity. Hours before the scheduled launch, the giant Saturn V was slowly taking fuel. Its tanks would be constantly topped up till seconds before liftoff. Michael Collins was the command module pilot. He had flown previously on Gemini 10. Buzz Aldrin was a lunar module pilot. He had pioneered new techniques for spacewalking on Gemini 12. And the mission commander was Neil Armstrong. On Gemini 8, his cool head and quick thinking had saved the mission from tragedy. Apollo 11 would have a fully experienced team chosen to deal with and solve difficult problems. And there would be problems. Every NASA mission had built upon the experience of previous missions, but there was always a point when they entered unknown territory, and the pressure to reach the moon before the end of 1969 had been unrelenting. We're going to the moon but across America, people were supremely confident, and launch parties were held across the country. Local entrepreneurs were quick to capitalize on the mood of celebration. The swing arm now coming back as our countdown continues. At the Kennedy Launch Center, tension was high. For German-born rocket pioneer Werner von Braun, his whole life had been leading up to this moment. Firing command coming in now. Everyone at the Cape understood how many different components had to work correctly for a successful launch. Astronauts agreed that the launch made them most anxious. Firing command coming in now. This would be the sixth launch of the Saturn V booster. And while some of these flights had been a little lumpy, all were regarded as successful. T minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Six, 
cleared the launch tower, control was transferred from the firing room at the Cape Complex to Mission Control in Houston. Twelve minutes after launch, Apollo 11 was in low Earth orbit. Apart from a slightly rough ride with the third stage, everything had been routine. Translunar injection and docking with the lunar module were now practices that had been done many times before, and they too were achieved with little fuss. The cruise to the moon and lunar orbit had been done twice before, and flight manuals and checklists had all been rewritten with the benefit of previous experience. The Apollo system had been designed so that all navigation observations and engine burns could be made by the crew, but radio ranging techniques had improved so rapidly that mission control was now giving all the instructions. However, the crew still used the onboard technology to determine their position in case of a communications problem. Command module pilots took pride in the accuracy of their navigation. Both the command and lunar modules were equipped with the Apollo guidance computer, one of the first practical microcomputers. We recommend you accept the now 49. For most computations, there was a manual workaround. But for the complex flight path required for the lunar module to land on the moon, the flight computer was essential. In lunar orbit, the crew of Apollo 11 would lose radio contact every time they passed behind the moon. We'd like you to press on to star 44, over. During the 13th orbit, the lunar module separated from the command module. Roger, how does it look? The eagle has wings. Roger. The two craft now adopted individual call signs. The command module became Columbia, and the lunar module was now Eagle. Descent to the moon happened in three separate stages, each controlled by its own computer program. Uh, Roger, let us know when you're ready to copy. We have a DOI pad. The, the first uh, stage was the braking phase that changed the orbit so it would reach a zone above the designated landing point. During this period, the crew were traveling feet first, looking up at the Earth. The next stage was the approach phase, when the Eagle tipped up into a more vertical attitude. This was when Aldrin and Armstrong got their first view of the landing point. A long elliptical region in the Sea of Tranquility was their target. The open plain was judged to be the easiest place for the first lunar landing. But unexpected things began happening. Fuel in the lunar lander's tanks began sloshing around. While this was not dangerous, the motion meant the craft could give no clear indication about its pre-programmed landing site. The 1202, 1202. Give us a reading on the 1202 program alarm. Then the flight computer began sounding an alarm, and there was only one person in mission control that knew what a 1202 alarm was. A young software engineer understood the computer was overloaded, but that it could still look after critical functions. Delta H is looking good now. Roger, Delta H is looking good to us. The mission would continue. Roger, we got you. We're going at alarm. The final part of the landing sequence was still computer controlled, but it allowed the commander to override the craft's rate of descent and its positioning. As it was heading for a field of large boulders, Armstrong took control, looking for an appropriate landing area. This took longer than anyone expected. Hey, 75 feet, guys looking good, down a half. Six forward. 
fuel was running low. 60 seconds. Lights on. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Hit. 40 feet down two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Down and a half. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Good. Okay. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Boat control, both auto, descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. The relief in mission control was palpable. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Because of the distractions during the descent, no one had a clear idea of the Eagle's exact location. Okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. After I'm on, take care of the descent. After the craft was made secure, the flight plan called for the astronauts to get some sleep, but Armstrong and Aldrin requested a change, which was agreed to. They began preparing for their walk on the lunar surface. Seven hours later, Armstrong was climbing down the ladder. A black and white TV camera was now activated, and around the world, 600 million people were watching. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This was something new. No one had thought that history would be televised with the world as witness. It had been argued that television was a waste of time. Now, NASA was rescheduling future missions so their astronauts would step onto the moon in prime time. Armstrong and Aldrin spent two and a half hours on the lunar surface and much of that time was used in ceremonial duties such as planting the US flag and chatting to the president. The trip back to lunar orbit went smoothly. From here, the three astronauts were back on thoroughly understood ground. The three-day return cruise to Earth was a calm period before a storm of publicity obligations that the Apollo 11 astronauts had not prepared for. Armstrong, Aldrin and Collins were fated in ticker tape parades across the United States and then across the world. NASA was keen to build on this wave of popularity, but the final three scheduled moon landings were soon cancelled, and although the remaining moon missions became more ambitious and complex, the American people lost interest. The Apollo program ended in 1972. Nobody has been back to the moon since. <laughs>